Hi, this is Dr. Kevin Crane, and I'm going to give you a quick overview of acute kidney injury and chronic kidney diseases, which really form the foundational information that you need to know. So we're going to begin by looking at how kidney disease presents. Commonly, it can be seen in screening for common diseases, where there are clinical findings, sometimes an incidental lab, and occasionally as uremia, but rarely as symptoms like flank pain. We screen with serum creatinine, and we assess renal function using functional formulas that look at the GFR, which is particularly important in chronic kidney disease. Now, kidney disease itself can be divided between that's acute, which is shown with an increase in serum creatinine over 0.3, and the other features are shown, or you can have chronic kidney disease defined as greater than three months with functional abnormalities, and certainly the most important thing is knowing what the baseline kidney function is and whether there was a change. So let's start with acute kidney injury. In evaluating acute kidney injury, the focus is really on whether there are systemic symptoms, any medications, including over-the-counters or procedures, the physical exam and volume status, and then looking at the urinalysis, particularly for cells and casts, determining the fraction of excretion of sodium. We then divide this into pre-renal kidney failure, the first of three pieces, with true volume depletion, effective decrease in the cardiac output, or functional changes. And the key things are looking at the urinalysis, which is relatively benign, or a fraction of excretion of sodium less than one. Decreased effective volume can be due to a decrease in the systolic function and a decrease in cardiac output, or to circulatory collapse with shock. On the other hand, hemodynamically mediated is shown through this cartoon, where you look at the glomerulus, thinking of blood coming in for the afferent arteriole, which is under the production primarily of prostaglandins under conditions that decrease afferent flow, or on the efferent side, things that cause angiotensin II dependence in renal function, and of course then you have the tubules leading to urine production. And the key feature about the GFR is that it's the pressure in the glomerular capillary minus Bowman space, minus the oncotic pressures in the glomerular capillary, times an ultrafiltration coefficient. And non-steroidals affect the prostaglandins on the afferent side, and ACE and ARBs block angiotensin on the efferent side, and in conditions that are necessary, that results in acute hemodynamically mediated renal failure. So let's turn to those diseases that are intrinsic to the kidney itself, so-called intrinsic kidney failure. The first type is really related to acute glomerulonephritis, an entire topic we'll talk about separately. And of course, the key features are hematuria and proteinuria, particularly if you look at the urinalysis and you see these features, which are red blood cell casts. More importantly is to keep in mind acute tubular necrosis, a disorder caused by either ischemia to the kidney with shock or by toxins, such as radiocontrast or a variety of drugs, all of which can damage the kidney tubules, leading to either an immediate cessation of renal function, which can be a oliguric or non-oliguric. Looking at the urinalysis, the key features are the dirty brown casts that are seen and a fractional excretion of sodium that goes up. And finally, there's acute interstitial nephritis, which is a hypersensitivity reaction often related to drugs, though there are other causes, in which case patients develop acute kidney injury. And here you see the infiltration of the interstitium with eosinophils, which are characteristic. And finally, the last form of acute kidney injury is that causing postrenal or obstruction. Anything obstructing the urinary tract can lead to dilatation of the calocele system of the kidney, as shown here. The urinalysis tends to be relatively benign, and it's important to always consider that in evaluating these patients. Now let's turn to chronic kidney disease, which can be either tubular interstitial or glomerular, and the most common causes are diabetes and hypertension followed by glomerulophritis. But we always look at the electronic GFR and the degree of proteinary in evaluating patients because we stage patients for chronic kidney disease based on their GFR, which tells us where they are in progressive chronic kidney disease, and it helps with management. Now, signs and symptoms with advancing stages of kidney disease can be due to hypertension. They can be due to mineral and bone disease. An important problem 
that can be managed by understanding the pathophysiology, and it begins with a decrease in the kidney function. Once the kidney function actually deteriorates, a process is initiated where there is decreased phosphorus secretion and decreased production of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D by the kidney. This subsequently leads to an increase in the serum phosphorus, and this increase in the serum phosphorus then stimulates a variety of other complications, particularly in the bones where there's an increased production of FGF23, which is a hormone or substance that is meant to decrease the serum phosphorus when it does rise. So it decreases phosphorus absorption, and it also decreases 125-dihydroxy vitamin D synthesis as well. Now, the decrease in serum phosphorus will, uh, excuse me, the increase in serum phosphorus will result in a decrease in the serum calcium, and this uh, needs to be considered in evaluating and treating patients. So the treatment for the high phosphorus is diet and a variety of phosphate binders. The fall in the serum calcium, along with the increased production of FGF23, results in an important complication of chronic kidney disease, which is that of secondary hyperparathyroidism. So increased PTH production subsequently occurs. And once PTH is increased in production, it then also affects the bones by releasing calcium. So the treatment is to replete 25-hydroxy vitamin D, replete 125 vitamin D, and also many times give calcium supplements. Another substance that's used in patients who are already on dialysis is sinicalcid, which stimulates the vitamin D calcium sensing receptor. So if there's increased release of calcium from the bones, that's meant to mitigate the complications that occur. Other problems include the anemia, the retention of salt, potassium, and water, and then the development of uremia, which starts with malaise and fatigue, followed later by pericarditis, encephalopathy, and significant symptoms. Treatment in these patients is to initiate either hemodialysis, as shown here, where patients need a vascular access, usually an AV fistula, or home peritoneal dialysis, where patients are exchanging through, fluid through the peritoneum. Or finally, patients may require transplant, which is the ideal treatment for end-stage renal disease. So this has been a rather quick walkthrough of